こんにちは、ブルーホースです。今日もデトロイトの特典見ていきましょう。でね、映像パートをやってたんですが、前回ね、ちょっとね、せっかく映像でいろいろいいことを喋ってたりとかしてたのに、僕がベラベラ喋って、ちょっと邪魔じゃないかなとも思ったんで、残り1、2、3、4、5、6個あるんだけど、まあ、それを今日ちょっとまとめてみたいんですが、僕はね、もう一切音声喋らないで、あのー、もう皆さんは映像に集中してもらえたらと思いますんで、今から僕はね、音声切ってやっていきたいと思いますんで、映像だけ僕はお楽しみくだ。デトロイト become human was produced over a period of four years. Here in Paris, we have a team of about 180 people, and to that, we need to add also all the outsourcing. With our partners in the Philippines, in China, Vietnam, and in India. So, when we started working on this story, I had to、um, imagine where Kara was built. And、um, for whatever reason, the city of Detroit came very quickly to my mind because it had already an incredible story by itself of、uh, history and themes. So, we traveled there with a team and we were really moved by what we saw and we could really、um, feel. The desire to fight and, and really、uh, be born again. And we just continued this curve, this growth, and just imagine what Detroit would be like if the Android industry was、um, you know, using these huge factories to build Androids there. A very strong element in Detroit is that there's a lot of industrial wasteland and a lot of nature too. And for us, the graphic designers, it was an incredible playground. The destroyed zones which we wanted to preserve. We appropriated them to turn into something else. Then, in the areas that needed to be rebuilt, we were able to imagine our Detroit of the future. We didn't want to make a science fiction universe, but a world of anticipation. If we chose science fiction, we could have imagined flying cars, extraterrestrials, but those things are very far from our current everyday life. Anticipation is more about gleaning from our contemporary reality, the one we know. Because Detroit is set in 2038, and 2038 is tomorrow. The difficulty we had was sticking to reality. That is to say, technology becoming more and more invisible, a lot more elegant, and at the same time, making it visual. So, all the computer equipment, autonomous cars, we simply had to invent. They are, in fact, very technological objects, but at the same time, remain very credible and ingrained in reality. To create a cohesive universe in the fashion and clothing of the human characters in 2038, I didn't want to put an accent on strange shapes or really vibrant colors and things we wouldn't know. That I wanted to keep for the androids. The goal was to create something familiar which we can identify with in this future setting. Working on the artistic direction for the androids was a bit special because this is a project about the place they could occupy in the human world. It was out of the question for them to be too beautiful or too perfect. They had to correspond to every social class, rich and poor. Inspired by everyday utilitarian clothes, I brought a modern touch by adding dynamic display surfaces, the armband we can see on the side, the triangle on the front and back, an LED. Like that, there's no confusion. Once we cast the actors, we travel to meet them in order to scan their faces. We record the structure of their face with the scan. And we record the colors and patches of skin with photography. Once we have this information, We will use this as a basis for modeling and creating the characters. The artist will make it more realistic but will also enrich it. He will propose ideas which we will develop together. Finally, we will have a character with character who corresponds to the project in the world. When the actors come to Quantic Dream, we show them the design, what their image will be, and what they will look like in the game. This extra information gives them another dimension and color to connect with emotionally. It helps them think about how to play their character. Your mission. That's all you care about, huh? You should consult a professional who can help you. Beat it, you hear me? Get the hell out of here! So there are three types of shoots at Quantic Dream shooting and performance capture, where you capture the whole actor, his voice, his face, and his body. These shoots are obviously done with American actors because the game's original version is in American English. 
After that, there are the body-only shoots, representing around 250 days of filming, while the performance capture is 100 days of filming. Now, body-only shoots, there are two types. There are the action shoots and the technical shoots, which are mokit shoots. Mokit is when the player controls a character on the screen and he moves in an environment to explore it. This is of particular importance at Quantic Dream, and therefore we shoot a lot to offer a unique context for each scene and each character. To prepare a motion capture shoot, we first get together to look at the sets we need, the animations that we want to shoot, which ones need to be grouped together, or which ones need to be cut and shot at another time, so that we get the most out of the shooting day. This often means shooting scenes out of order, especially those with big props or accessories, like a big car, for example. So we shoot all the animations related to that particular prop first. The biggest challenge for the mocap team was shooting a Spider-Man mo-kit. We had to build a wall and attach an actor to a harness with cables so we could pull him up and render him climbing. The shooting on this game total took about, I would say, more than a year, maybe one and two years, with about 300 actors on, on set. So I would say it's quite a massive production. But so much happened on this set between the stunts and the shootings with a little girl and, and all the, these great actors that we had. It was really a, a very, very memorable journey for the team and for myself. Today, Detroit has over 37,000 animations. When we retrieve the motion capture data, it's just a cloud of points, which represent all the markers worn by the actors. From this cloud of points, we have a phase called retargeting, which gives us a skeleton. The skeleton will be applied to the characters of the game. There is still work to be done, but this gives us the main movements. Since we are working on something very realistic, we must recognize the actor and also recover all the emotion he expresses in his performance. We use a system of facts, an identity card for each actor. We make the actor do a whole range of facial expressions. Then we recover all the expressions and paste the animations on a puppet that Jan has prepared. I then recover and refine these poses. I might stretch the lip, reinflate a cheek, tiny details that make the finished product really capture the actor. Because of the nature of our mocap system today, when we receive the animations, we're missing eye movements, and so the character has that dead look. He really has no eyes, so then it's a big part of the work for the animators to find the regard of the actor in relation to his position, in relation to the body, etc. It was crazy when I saw the newest model for Kara, because they've been working on it and working on it, and this was the first time I literally jumped in my seat. It not only looked so much like me, it was the fact that it looked so lifelike. It wasn't that it looked just like it was a camera, it was something else, you know, but it looked alive. It's exciting, and it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> game after game, we learned the rules of, of optics and, and filming. And uh, our goal with Detroit Become Human was to have cameras that would actually emulate the optics of a real physical camera. So basically dealing with uh, real world imperfections was our main task. And uh, just to make cameras look as real as we can. Once the animations are shot and processed by the animation department, integrated and polished. We film them, that is to say, we really do a mise-en-scene, as in cinema. The real difficulty of our job is to know if these cameras are telling us something. Are they in the emotion of the scene? Do they describe exactly what the action must convey, what must be felt? The most important challenge for me was one of the final scenes where Marcus decides to start the revolution and go to the battlefield. Very quickly, we imagine this to be a huge sequence shot. We wanted the feeling of a cameraman running behind us while showing Marcus, the androids who help him, the person shooting at us, etc. Above all, it was necessary to say to oneself, this scene is very violent but does not glorify war. On the contrary, 
that war is something improbable and absurd. It was really a fun challenge. The idea was to say we have three characters. We would like each of them to have a specific cinematography. We wanted Kara to be much more film with some kind of handheld camera to have something very living, very breathing. For Connor, we wanted something very cold and very perfect. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic and spectacular. So it was about the, the filming, but it was also about the photography. So we worked with a, with a director of photography to give each character a different lighting, different key colors. Each of them would have their own worlds. And finally, we worked with the composers so they would create a specific sound for each character, so each would have his own world and his own style. For the original du jeu, on essaie d'être. For the soundtrack of the game, we tried to be very close to what is done in film. We were constantly asking at each place in the game, why are we putting music here? What is it going to say? So we focused the music on bringing emotion, which is interactive and supports the character's art. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know I love you, don't you? You know I love you. We make games that are very narrative. We're really into interactive drama. So the soundtrack also had to go in that direction supporting the three characters' very different stories. We really wanted three colors, three musical sound identities, and from there, having three composers made sense, since the story of Kara, Marcus, and Connor are all completely different. You recognize him? It's Carlos Ortiz. For Connor, we wanted a soundtrack that could be very cold and very um, mechanical, very machine-esque somehow. For Kara, we wanted a soundtrack that would be very moving and emotional. It was about the quest for identity, but it was also a journey about love and empathy. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic, some, something that would really represent the grand aspect of his quest. And we were very fortunate to find three incredibly talented composers, and working with them has been a dream, honestly. My name is Philip Shepard and I'm a composer and a cellist and a producer and today we're at Abbey Road Studio One which is my favourite studio in the world and today we're recording the soundtrack for Cara from Become Human. So when I compose a big project, I often travel just to kind of get out you know, and get some fresh air and some inspiration. And I go um, hiking and traveling in Montana a lot. I had a, a log fire in the room that I was staying in and the flames were kind of making absolutely direct music. And it became the basis for Cara's theme and it sounds something like this. the top of that, I found a little theme that just seemed to fit over the top, which is taking Kara's name, Kara, Kara, and just using like a two-syllable motif, and it sounds like this. over. So it kind of works in lots of levels and in fact every single theme in the score has one of those elements built into it and it becomes sort of the DNA of every single tune. For me, writing this theme for Kara, I actually had to tap in to what it feels like to be a father to daughters. 
I really had to tap into everything I feel about my daughters. I'm thinking, well, if I had to write music for them and that sense of trying to protect them but also give them the freedom, that's totally where it came from. Because each composer has been given the sort of narrative responsibility for very different characters, I haven't had to sort of go into other styles. I can actually be very loyal to this particular character and sort of hopefully encapsulate her. But it means also I've suddenly become very connected to this character. And if for some reason it goes to game over early, I'm getting mortified. <laughs> you know? They're over there! Starting a new project for me personally, it's always finding the right tone, finding the right color, I like to call it. For me, it's finding that right texture that actually sits against picture really well. One of the biggest things is I created custom instruments for Connor. I pulled out all my vintage synthesizers um, to be able to capture this robotic person, if you will. My approach to uh, all of these custom instruments is that I hear the sound in my head. Um, and either I could just come into the piano and just be like, all right, so I'm gonna just get on the computer and just create it. I'd rather be able to play these instruments physically. As soon as you see Connor the first time, there is a really interesting um, thematic idea that you hear, and it's that's just made out of a Moog synthesizer, but completely manipulated in multiple ways. And it's it's robotic. It has a little bit of an emotional to it. it he's he's on his mission, so you feel that as well. So it just kind of gives you that cold, motionless, with a mission in hand that you kind of feel throughout the whole thing. Because the music evolved, one of the things that I was very weary and I was very kind of uh, focused on was the way that the music has to evolve. So my idea behind it was that Connor is a singular android that could at any point become a deviant or could actually stay as an android. So I created a more or less an, uh, Connor theme and then I was able to just manipulate it in different aspects of it. Is everything okay, Lieutenant? Chris was on patrol last night. He was attacked by a bunch of deviants. I'm a human being writing for a robot. And throughout uh, Connor's journey, he meets someone, he meets a partner. So how do you deal with a robot feeling? And I've met a partner that I'm gonna work with, uh, or all of a sudden he sees a dead body. Does this robot have an imagination? Does this robot have a feeling? And if yes, how do you translate that into non-emotional music? Uh, so it basically at any point I was just like, I can't do this, I can't do this, and then I just do it. <laughs> Property was damaged and fires continue to rage in several major districts across the city. Some people are asking, have androids become a threat to our security? When I first started really digging in on Marcus, um, the one thing that I really try to capture was the transformation process. You know, Marcus is this android that evolves over the course of the game and, and really goes from kind of figuring out that he's more than just an android. You know, he's starting to develop kind of a human soul in a, in a way. Try to imagine something that doesn't exist, something you've never seen. Now concentrate on how it makes you feel and let your hand drift across the canvas. On the other side of Marcus that I really latched onto was that he almost became a savior for a lot of the other androids in the game. So when I started developing the theme for Marcus, I really made it like a church hymn. I wanted it to be very simple. I wanted to make it a chordal melody. I really wanted to make it almost like a Bach hymn. The tough thing with that is it had to be recognizable. If I made it too complex from a harmonic standpoint, it would be hard, I think, for people to kind of pick it out and recognize it. It's very acoustic derived, but it's, it's also been treated with a lot of uh, effects and things to kind of put it into the space that I, I, I felt the sound should be in. 
It can be beautiful, it can be haunting, it can be extremely powerful um, from an action standpoint. Um, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. The music is, um, is there, but it's subliminal and it's emotional and people are, are, are feeling it and it's not distracting. And that's tricky with a game like this where you have to have a lot of ins and outs like that where, where the music kind of has to get in and out of these moments. This is a war we're fighting with the humans. If we fail, they'll destroy us. I think the game's been put together so well where I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't ruining the emotion. I gotta be honest, when we first started on this path, I said, oh man, this could be pretty messy, you know? I mean, it could feel disconnected and... But I mean, it's amazing how they really guided us and got us to really kind of all be in the same world, but at the same time feeling completely different. So it's really going to stand out and kind of be one of those games where um, people are really going to notice the music and kind of how it was crafted and, you know, and all the hard work that went into making, being able to pull it off in a graceful way. じゃあ、まずは名前を教えて。くらえ、まずは自己紹介をしてくれるかな。もちろん。私はサイバーライフ初のアシスタント用アンドロイド。私の機能は例えば家事をしたり、料理とか、スケジュール管理とか、日常業
Goodbye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. Rock. Goodbye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bough breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. Rock. Goodbye, baby, in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. In the space of a few years, androids have completely transformed the world in which we live. By letting androids into our homes and factories, the CyberLife company has made them everyday technology. The founder of CyberLife, Elijah Kamsky, is a very discreet man, despite being the CEO of the highest valued company in the world and being voted man of the year by Century Magazine, he remains a mystery for most people. That's why we at KNC are so excited to be here as CyberLife opens its doors for the first time. Elijah Kamsky, could you please tell us where we are? Certainly, and welcome. We're currently in CyberLife's production center in Detroit, where all models are designed and manufactured. More than 10,000 androids come off the production line every day. Fascinating. Could you tell us what your goal was when you founded CyberLife? Hmm. Well, I simply wanted to use technology to carry out all of our most annoying and repetitive tasks so we'd have more time to enjoy life. I imagine you must have faced many challenges. Yes, there were technical challenges, but the hardest thing was to design an object that we would want to welcome into our homes. We had to imagine a machine in our own image that resembles us in every way, that moves, breathes, blinks like us, but yet is smarter and more capable than any human being. Let me show you around. We're here in production unit four. Could you explain in a few words how the androids are made? Sure, yeah, it's very simple. We use machines to manufacture machines. The removable parts are assembled on a production line, and then we apply a synthetic skin to the whole body. A human operator checks the cognitive abilities with a pre-established protocol, and finally, the android is conditioned and sent out throughout the country. Here's your result. Say something. Hello. I am a RZ400 model. How can I be of service? You can go now. Our androids are already replacing humans in many fields. For example, they represent more than 80% of all university professors and 63% of all medical staff. Tomorrow they'll replace our soldiers, and who knows, maybe one day, our leaders to make the best decisions in humanity's interest. Come on. Replacing humans with machines has led to record unemployment of hmm. 28%. What do you think about the situation? Uh, <laughs> okay. The first steam engines also caused an increase in unemployment. But no one today would imagine turning back the clock. Artificial intelligence 
makes everyday lives easier. Nothing can stop progress. What's happening here is inevitable. These days, more and more people choose to live with an android rather than another human being. Does this development worry you? Hmm. Everything's much easier with an android. They obey your orders without ever complaining. They can cook, discuss philosophy with you, have intimate relationships according to your desires. They never say no. Obviously, they are the perfect partner. Everyone deserves happiness. Why deprive yourself of so-called moral reasons when a machine can make you happy? Many science fiction books tell the story of how machines become more intelligent than us and end up confronting us. Aren't you worried about that possibility? I understand the irrational fears about artificial intelligence, but I assure you, that will never happen with a CyberLife android. They're designed to obey humans. They're machines. They can't ever develop uh, any sort of desires or, or form of consciousness. Are you sure? I'm absolutely certain. You can trust me. <laughs>